Howdy there, I'm Zane Lewis, and today I'll be telling you the story of one of Colorado's most unknown and forgotten ghost towns called Farnham Spur, which sits deep in the Rocky Mountains along Boreas Pass with some of the most spectacular mountain and forest scenery you'll ever see. While today only a few scattered remains of it still exist, it was once a mining camp linked to the outside world by the Denver, South Park, and Pacific Railroad, and today you can still see its remains, raw, rugged, and beautiful. How was this town founded? What hardships did the residents suffer through? What led to the site's demise? Well, sadly we don't have all the answers, but using the sources that we have and archaeological methods, we will uncover the vast and rich history of Farnham Spur and the 740 Mine. The story of Farnham Spur first begins in the 1860s when thousands of prospectors from the grassland basin of South Fork, Colorado began crossing Boreas Pass, which at the time was called Breckenridge Pass, to search for gold in the Valley of the Blue during the Colorado Gold Rush. In 1866, the pass was widened to make room for stagecoaches and wagons. Fifteen years later, in 1881, the Denver, South Park and Pacific Railroad, which at the time was controlled by the Union Pacific Railroad, began constructing a line across it, reaching the site of Farnham Spur in 1882. They did so under the direction of the Union Pacific's president, Sidney Dillon, who decided to rename the past Boreas, which is the name of the ancient Greek god of the North Wind. It is unknown exactly when Farnham Spur was first constructed. As the name suggests, it was built as a 480-foot-long railroad spur along the DSP and P's line to service the 740 mine. We can assume that the town likely started up at around 1882 since that's when the railroad arrived. Farnham Spur was not the only town constructed along Boreas Pass. The town of Farnham, which is sometimes confused with Spur to the point of getting called the same exact town, was constructed very close to it, within one-fifth of a mile. The towns of Argentine, Boreas, and Dwyer were also built along the pass, all being connected to the South Park's line. It appears that both Farnham and Farnham Spur were either founded by or named after the same person, W.H. Farnham. Despite the similar name, there were differences in what went on at each of the towns. Farnham was more of a tourist town, with a hotel, and with some independent mining being performed, while its neighbor was a company mining camp with the biggest aerial tramway in all of Summit County. There were about seven buildings in all at Farnham Spur, the most important of them being the two-story nerve center for the 740 mine. The first floor included things such as a blacksmith shop, controls for operating the tramway, a compressor, and other various workstations. The second floor contained both the mine office as well as a bunkhouse that had space for up to 15 men. Aside from that, there was also a large boarding house, two work and storage structures, a kitchen, a section house built for the railroad, as well as a small and isolated boarding house for the railroad workers. There happens to be a can dump at the site of the large boarding house, and an analysis of 50 of those cans by archaeologist Roger C. Fleet found that all but one were open top indicating that there must have been some significant activity there from 1904 onward. The can that wasn't open top happens to be a Norton Company can, which means that some activity occurred here between 1887 and 1904. About 45% of the cans were milk cans, and no specialty cans, such as sardine or baking soda cans, could be discovered. It would make sense for the period from 1904 onward to have been when the most important operations at the mine went on. Farnham Spur failed to obtain a post office during its lifetime, so it was probably serviced by the post office at the neighboring Farnham, which operated from December 1881 to November 1895. 
The site of the town is about 11,197 feet in altitude and is milepost 100.3 from Denver along the railroad line. The camp serviced the 740 mine, which I believe was owned by W.H. Lip and the Consolidated Mining Company. Legend has it that it was originally called the 730 mine, as that was the time the employees were supposed to begin work at. However, they were oftentimes late, and the name slipped to 740. There were two adits at this mine, the first one being at 11,958 feet, and the second one at 12,318 feet. There were also free exploratory adits higher up, which I don't think went very far into the mountain. For anyone who doesn't know, an adit is a horizontal entrance to a mine, differing from a mine shaft, which is a vertical entrance to a mine. I believe there were three different structures at this mine, possibly more. There was a small boarding house, a bunkhouse with a capacity of eight people, and a shaft house. Along the mountain leading down to Farnham Spur was an aerial tramway. At over a mile long, this tramway was an engineering marvel and the longest in Summit County. In order to operate, one of the mine's most necessary pieces of equipment would have been a compressor. It could power mining machinery such as air systems, drills, rock crushers, drill steel sharpeners, hoists, etc. Compressors violently vibrated when they were in use, so they had to be bolted down in order to avoid damaging the structures they were housed in. Another investigation by Rogers suggests that the compressor at Farnham Spur was far too small to efficiently power the mining equipment at the 740, including the aerial tramway. Based off of this, it is reasonable for us to assume that there were frequent breakdowns of equipment and only a few buckets at a time were run over the tramway. A compressor physically cannot operate without a steam boiler. The boiler would generally have to be placed fairly close to the compressor to avoid any loss of energy, which would typically happen through steam cooling and long piping systems. In the case of Farnham Spur, the boiler was almost certainly about 8 to 10 feet away from the compressor, meaning that steam or power loss wasn't any sort of problem whatsoever. The boiler's footprint indicated that instead of being covered by a structure, it was outside of the mine building. This was likely because of how big the heat buildup was in the boiler's operation. Mines generally used rock masonry as well as red and yellow firebrick masonry to construct the foundations of their steam boilers. Mines with a higher budget sometimes used firebrick, which was expensive and oftentimes hard to bring to the site of the mining operation due to poor transportation routes. Mines with a lower budget and that were in remote locations would have used rock, as it was an easy material to come by. The 740 mine used rock for its foundations, indicating that it had a low budget to work with. A boiler also needed a significant amount of water, and thankfully for the 740 mine, there was a high flow stream or river of some kind that the company was able to dam up on the mountain. The water was then piped all the way to the site below. Not only was this used to power the boiler, but also the mine's main building, boarding house, and section house with varying uses. It is likely that wood was the energy source for the boiler at Farnham Spur. We can conclude this due to the absence of clinkers. Clinkers could possibly be discovered on the ground in front of the boiler if the mine used coal or coke as its energy source, as that was where stray clinkers would fall when the ash pan was cleaned out. If the boiler used wood, then there wouldn't be any remnants of clinkers, and the ash would have been blown away at some point, especially after being abandoned for more than a hundred years. If clinkers are found at a mining site, then you can know for sure that a boiler was once there, and you also know that it used coal or coke as its energy source. The blacksmith forge at the 740 mine was located in the northeast corner of what was formerly the mine building, an indication that a forge was built at a mining site would be a small mound of rock being built a few inches up from the floor and generally in a corner of some kind. In some cases, particularly in the more remote mine sites, 
the blacksmith area might have a quenching tank along with an anvil post. Finding an anvil at a mine site would be damn near impossible as an object like that was way too valuable to leave behind. A quenching tank was an object that might be found near an anvil workstation. It had water of various degrees where the blacksmith would dunk any hot objects he desired to cool. Oftentimes, the floor surrounding the tank was simply just dirt, which the reasoning for this was an attempt to prevent any fire catastrophes. While quite often absent, finding a firmly placed post being around 18 inches high and 10 to 12 inches in diameter, being near the forge, is another positive sign that a blacksmith worked hard there. The anvil was placed on top of the stump and bolted down by four large and bent nails. These nails can help identify an anvil post, contradicting the notion that a post is just a cut down tree. Sadly, not a single anvil post or quenching tank can be traced to having once been at Farnham Spur, or any of the other free ghost towns along Boreas Pass. Moving on, Farnham Spur's aerial tramways or buckets normally carried a high concentration of ore. However, on occasion they carried drill steels that required the blacksmith to sharpen them. They also carried broken equipment, garbage, necessities such as food, water and other supplies, and even miners who found it more convenient rather than walking the mile long hike across the treacherous mountain to and from the mine in town. While pictures like this one always rightfully glorify the miners who rode the tramways and cement them as legends of Colorado, riding in an ore bucket was by no means safe. If they simply lost their grip for a brief second or caused the bucket to tilt, they could find themselves falling many feet to the rocky mountain below, which many times could result in death. Not to mention what would happen if a body part or piece of clothes got caught in a cable wheel. The lower end of the tramway, at the town site of Farnham Spur, was where the cable turned around a bull wheel in order to begin heading back up the rough mountainside to their destination of the 740. The lower end of the tram system is also where the ore that had been transported down from the mine was placed into the ore bin. The ore was stored safely in the bin until the Denver, South Park, and Pacific Railroad took it to Breckenridge. The ore would be dumped from an ore bin into a gondola car on the dead end of the spur track. Unlike many mines, a mill was absent from the site of the 740 mine, meaning that ore treatment had to be performed in Breckenridge. The mine could have saved a lot of money if it had a mill, as it could have paid less in transportation costs. A concentration mill would have taken out all of the invaluable rocks thus allowing solely the ores to be transported to a processing mill in Breckenridge, which would have saved a huge amount of money. The boarding house at Farnham Spur was placed on the south side of the town, or in other words, downhill from the tracks. The reason for this was because there was little room in the town for a big two-story boarding house with a kitchen, and the only room available was apparently on the south side. The railroad spur at the town split off from the South Park's main line near the boarding house and ended near the 740's tramway, with no room to build anything in between the two lines. Surrounding the tracks, on the north periphery there were three separate mine buildings, while the east side contained the railroad section house, which could house up to eight people and had a water pipe. And finally, the west side held both the Orban and the tramway. There were also some wagon roads at the town site, as wagons and animals would be used to help unload their supplies onto the train. About 200 feet into the forest, East of the section house lay a small yet well-built cabin which was only about 30 feet by 15 feet big built out of milled lumber. For whatever reason, it was built away from the rest of the camp. Outside of the cabin's main door, there was a root or potato cellar which today is just a depression. There was also an outhouse a few feet away from the front door. What was this building, you ask? It was the boarding house for the railroad crews who lived in the section house nearby. It is believed that a husband and wife worked the eating area inside the boarding house, 
However, their identities are unknown. It is possible that this small boarding house did not operate for very long. The reason we can conclude this is because of the lack of a can dump, which can often be found at many mining sites that typically lasted for a little while. In fact, there only have been two cans discovered in this area, which gives us reason to believe that this house was only used for a bit. Another thing the analysis tells us is that the miners ate things with lots of nutrients, however the variety of nutrients they took in was almost certainly limited. It is unknown as to when Farnham Spur or the 740 mine died out. There are no known records of when this happened, however we know that it outlived the Denver, South Park and Pacific Railroad, which went bankrupt in 1889, however was reorganized as the Denver, Leadville and Gunnison Railroad. The Union Pacific Railroad, which still owned the line, went bankrupt in 1893 and the Gunnison's lines were sold to the Colorado and Southern. The line over Boreas Pass was finally abandoned in 1937. Based off of the experience of other Colorado ghost towns, like Amez, we can assume it probably died out sometime in the 1910s or early 20s whenever the 740 closed its doors, as the town's survival hinged on the mine's success and those years were when many towns became ghost towns. The last publication that listed Farnham Spur was Timetable No. 1 by the Colorado and Southern Railroad in 1922. However, I have been unable to obtain this document, so I am unsure as to whether that means Farnham Spur was still around that year or had died. One of the other ghost towns along Boreas Pass, Dwyer, is known to have lasted until at least 1918, possibly more. Beginning and closing dates are unknown for the rest of the ghost towns along Boreas Pass, with the exception of the railroad town on the top of the summit of the pass. It is also possible that the town closed down in 1937 when, as previously mentioned, the Colorado and Southern Railroad abandoned the line over Boreas Pass, however that is extremely unlikely. Whenever it died out, with the death of Farnham Spur, a beautiful part of Colorado's mining history, one filled with adventure, riches, and vibrant forests, faded into the abyss of history, with the town becoming yet another one of the many, many legends of Colorado. So, what remains of this place today? Not much. But while not much of this Colorado legend exists anymore, what does remain happens to be some interesting stuff. To get to the town, you must drive along Boreas Pass Road, which can be accessed from either the town of Breckenridge or Como. If you're driving to the site from Breckenridge, it should take you about 40 minutes to get there with no stops. If you're driving from Como, then about 36 minutes. I have put the town's coordinates up on screen and in the description, as they are way too complicated for me to even attempt to say. At the town site, you will find a grassy flatland surrounded by trees. This is where the main two-story mine building would have been. Today, there are two piles of wood. The first one, closest to the road, may have been a part of the mine building. The second pile of wood is the remains of the aerial tramway, so it may be possible that the first pile of wood was instead a part of the aerial tramway. Either one is possible. If you move past the second pile of remains into the trees, you'll find that the area has been turned into a beautiful campsite with multiple fireplaces. You can also discover prospect holes at the site, which were holes that were dug in order to test if the ground had any riches in them. If it did, then the miners would begin working the claim and a mine might spring up. About 200 feet into the trees, near where the railroad boarding house would have been, there is an outhouse. It is the sole remaining intact structure at not only Farnham Spur, but any of the four ghost towns along Boreas Pass. Argentine and Dwyer both have some structural remains, however no intact ones. What remains of the 740 mine? Well, using Google Satellite I was able to discover some collapsed structures ranging from parts of the aerial tramway to what looks to be the mine's boarding house. The mountain, 
which is called Mount Baldy, has been mined extensively, and there are numerous large mine dumps on it. I believe I have found what looks to be a collapsed entrance to a mine going straight into the mountain, which is called an adit, at one of these dumps. One of the most strange objects found near Farnham Spur, dating back to the 1960s, was a passive radio repeater, which is an electronic device that takes in a low level or weak radio signal and proceeds to transmit it at either a higher level or a higher power, so that way, the signal can traverse long distances without any loss in quality. It is a completely deflective system that requires quite literally no electrical supply. Today, it has been unmaintained and as a result is unusable. We still have no idea who placed the object there or why. As for the other ghost towns along Boreas Pass, two out of three of them still have some structural remains. Argentine, located close to the South Park's Baker's water tank, still has multiple beaten up cabins. Dwyer, which towards the turn of the century was renamed Belmont, still has a few remains. A mine shop building still stands next to a mine shaft which has been filled in with various materials including the remains of the shaft house that once lowered miners in and out of the mine. I believe there are other remains, however I cannot be certain as I myself have never been to the town. I plan to visit someday and when I do, I'll leave an update in the comments section. Farnham. The town closest to Spur has some old broken cans scattered around the site, however no structural remains, at least that I could see. The view from the grassy field that it once resided in is a photographer's dream shot. At the top of the summit on Boreas Pass, you can find a restored section house that was once used by the railroad. There are some other railroad remains up there, such as the foundations of what I believe was the stone engine house, as well as a short section of narrow gauge tracks that was relayed by a bunch of volunteers. There's even an old cabin right next to the section house that you can rent out for a night or two. As for the Denver, South Park, and Pacific Railroad, only two of its steam locomotives still exist. The first one being number 51, which has been renumbered Denver, Leadville, and Gunnison number 191, and is located at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden. It is the oldest authentic steam engine in the state. The second one, number 72, built in 1884 by Cook Locomotive Works, is on display at the Highline Railroad Park in Breckenridge and has been renumbered Colorado and Southern number 9. Parts of the South Park's line still exist today, like the line at Leadville, Colorado, which has been turned into a tourist route that you can still ride and see Colorado in all of its beauty, just like the glory days. It is my second favorite railroad in America, after the Durango and Silverton train. Another part of the old South Park line that still somewhat exists would be the facilities at Como. A group of wonderful volunteers have fixed up the roundhouse, turntable, along with a bunch of other trains, and relayed track. Every August, you can visit Como and participate in Boreas Pass Railroad Day where they run their Klondike steam locomotive along the line and you can ride along. In 2021, Railroad Day will be held on August 21st for anyone interested. I have personally volunteered for them, helping to relay track. They are a really wonderful group of people who truly care about preserving history. I'll leave a link in the description or comment section to their website where you can learn about what they do and volunteer for them and links to their fundraisers. I do highly recommend them. Whether it's the railroads, abandoned mines, or ghost towns, the history of Colorado is one of great hardships and disasters, but also wondrous adventures and riches. The men who hauled ore out of the mines, or ran a shop at a boom town, or even stamped tickets during a train ride, were simply going about their day-to-day -day life. They didn't know that someday, thousands would look back on them and their legacy, admiring the world they created. Thousands risked it all, immigrating to western states like California and Colorado, 
hoping to strike it rich and create a good life for themselves and their families. They paved the way for the world of all we know today, and I think that their legacy is something that will be remembered and preserved for years into the future. Yeah, Farnham Spur, the 740 Mine, and the Denver, South Park, and Pacific Railroad left quite a legacy, didn't they? Towns like Farnham Spur, along with the mines and railroads around them, held a promise of adventure and opportunity for all. This documentary is a lasting tribute to the world that the people back then created, and today, you can still see what they built, experiencing the country just as it was then, Raw, untamed, rugged, and beautiful. I'm Zane Lewis. Thanks for watching.